Welcome to Sleepy Eyes. I am your host, Varga. I take you on a journey in the dark of the night with warm tales. Take a moment to relax your body and mind with the current calmness. Breathe deeply, feel the energy inside, and let go of any tiredness. Put aside the past and focus on the peacefulness of the present moment. Recognize any tension in your body. Allow it to fade away and unwind. Discover your inner peace and simply unwind in the tranquility of now. Before going to sleep, prepare to read a story comfortably in this peaceful setting. Let the magic of words captivate you as you get lost in a tale or story. With the warmth from this peace and relaxation, your sleep will become even more serene. Close your eyes, embark on a journey with a touch of words. Let each word guide you a bit deeper toward the essence of your inner peace. Now, relax and enjoy the pleasure of getting lost in the enchanting world of the story before drifting into sleep. Sherlock Holmes Short Stories Writer Sir Arthur Conan Doyle The Three Garadevs Part 1 the case of the three Garadebs began late in June 1902, soon after the end of the South African War. Sherlock Holmes had just spent several days in bed, as was his habit from time to time, but that morning he came out of his bedroom with a pile of handwritten papers in his hand and a look of amusement in his grey eyes. My dear Watson, here is a chance for you to make some money, he said. Have you ever heard the name Garadeb? I admitted that I had not. Well, if you can find a man called Garadeb, both you and he will be rich. How can that be so? I asked. Ah, that's a long story, rather an amusing one, too. Quite unusual, in fact. A man is coming to see me about it in a few minutes, so I won't begin the story until he arrives. But Garadeb is the name we want. The telephone book was on the table beside me, and I turned over the pages in rather a hopeless hunt for a Garadeb, but to my surprise there was this strange name in its correct place. Here you are, Holmes. Here it is. Holmes took the book from my hand. Garadeb N, he read, 136 Little Ryder Street. I am sorry to disappoint you, Watson, but this Garadeb is the person who is employing me. That is the address on his letter. We want another Garadeb to match him. Just then, our housekeeper, Mrs. Hudson, came in and handed me a card. Why, here is another, I cried. The first name is different. This is John Garadeb, a lawyer from Kansas in America. Holmes smiled as he looked at the card. I am afraid you must make one more effort, Watson he said. I already know about this gentleman, though I certainly did not expect to see him here this morning, but he will be able to tell us a good deal that I want to know. A moment later he was in the room. Mr. John Garadeb was a short, powerful man with a round, fresh face. It was easy to believe that he was an American businessman or lawyer. He looked rather childlike, and had a broad, fixed smile on his face, but his eyes were surprising. I have rarely seen a pair of human eyes which were brighter, quicker, or sharper. His speech was American, but not very noticeably so. Mr. Holmes? he asked, looking at each of us in turn. Ah, yes, the photographs of you in the newspapers are not unlike you, sir, if I may say so. I believe you have had a letter from another Garadeb, Mr. Nathan Garadeb, haven't you? Please sit down, said Sherlock Holmes. I think we have a good deal to discuss. He picked up the pile of papers. You are, of course, the Mr. John Garadeb who is mentioned in these legal documents, but surely you have been in England for some time. Why do you say that, Mr. Holmes? A sudden look of suspicion appeared in the man's eyes because all your clothes are English. Mr. Garadeb laughed uncomfortably. 
I've read of your clever tricks as a detective, Mr. Holmes, but I never thought I would be the subject of them myself. How do you know my clothes are English? By the shoulders of your coat, the toes of your shoes. How could anyone doubt it? Well, well, I had no idea that I looked so much like an Englishman, but I came to England on business some time ago, and so, as you say, nearly all my clothes were bought in London, but I suppose your time is valuable, and I am not here to talk about fashions. Please let us now discuss those papers which you have in your hand. It was clear that in some way Holmes had annoyed our visitor, who now had a much less friendly expression on his round, childlike face. Have patience, Mr. Garideb, said my friend gently. Dr. Watson could tell you that these little tricks of mine are sometimes very useful in the end, in solving mysteries. But why hasn't Mr. Nathan Garideb come with you? Why did he bring you into the affair at all? asked our visitor with sudden anger. What have you to do with it? Here was a bit of professional business between two gentlemen, and now one of them is employing a private detective. I saw him this morning, and he told me of the stupid thing he had done, and that's why I'm here. But I do feel annoyed about it. Nobody suspects you of anything, Mr. Garadeb. Mr. Nathan Garadeb is only anxious to achieve something which, I believe, is equally important to both of you. He knew that I had means of getting information, and therefore it was natural that he should come to me. The anger gradually disappeared from our visitor's face. Well, I'm beginning to understand now, he said. When I went to see him this morning, and he told me he had written to a private detective, I just asked for your address and came along immediately. I don't want the police mixed up in a private matter. But if you are happy just to help us find the man, there can be no harm in that. Well, that is exactly what I am going to do, said Holmes. And now, sir, as you are here, you had better give us a clear account of the whole affair. My friend here, Dr. Watson, knows nothing of the details. Mr. Garadab looked at me in a way that was not particularly friendly. Need he know? he asked. We usually work together said Holmes. Well, there's no reason why it should be kept secret. I'll tell you the main facts, then. If you came from Kansas, I would not need to explain to you who Alexander Hamilton Garadeb was. He made his money by buying and selling houses and land, and afterwards he made a second fortune in the Chicago wheat market. Then he spent the money in buying more land, along the Arkansas River, west of Fort Dodge and in the end he owned a piece of land as big as Kent or Sussex here in England. It's sheep farming land and forest and mining land and land for growing crops on. In fact, it's more or less every sort of land that brings dollars to the man that owns it. He had no relatives, or if he had, I never heard of any, but he took a kind of pride in his unusual name. That was what brought us together. I was a lawyer at Topeka, and one day I had a visit from the old man, who was very excited about meeting another man with his own name, and he was determined to find out if there were any more Garadebs in the world. Find me another, he said. I told him I was a busy man, and could not spend my life wandering round the world in search of Garadebs. But that is exactly what you are going to do, if everything goes according to my plan, he replied. I thought he was joking, but I soon discovered that he was extremely serious. He died less than a year later, and after his death a will was found. It was the strangest will that had ever been seen in the state of Kansas. His property was divided into three parts, and I was to have one on condition that I found two Gary Debs who would share the rest. Each of the three shares is worth five million dollars. But until I have found two other Garadebs, none of the money is to be paid out. It was such an opportunity for me that I simply left my practice as a lawyer and set out to look for Garadebs. There is not a single one in the United States. I searched the whole country very thoroughly, sir, but discovered no Garadebs at all. Then I tried England, where I found the name of Mr. Nathan Garadeb in the London telephone book. 
I went to see the gentleman two days ago and explained the whole matter to him. But, like myself, he is alone in the world, with some female relatives, but no men. According to the old man's will, the three Garadebs must all be adult men. So you see, we still need one more man, and if you can help us to find him, we will be very ready to pay your charges. Well, Watson, said Holmes with a smile. I said this was rather an amusing case, didn't I? Mr. Garadeb, I think the first thing you should do is to put a small advertisement in the newspapers. I have done that already, Mr. Holmes. There were no replies. Oh, how disappointing. Well, it is certainly a very interesting little problem. I may look into it for you if I have time. It is interesting, Mr. Garadeb, that you should come from Topeka. I had a friend there who used to write to me. He is dead now. Old Dr. Lysander Starr, who was a member of the town council in 1890. Good old Dr. Starr, said our visitor. His name is still honored. Well, Mr. Holmes, I suppose the only thing we can do is to report to you and let you know how we progress. You will probably hear from us within a day or two. Then the American left. Holmes had lit his pipe, and he sat for some time with a strange smile on his face. Well, what do you think about all that? I asked at last. I am wondering, Watson, just wondering. About what? Holmes took his pipe from his lips. I was wondering, Watson, what this man could possibly hope to achieve by telling us such a large number of lies. I nearly asked him what his real purpose was. There are times when a sudden, sharp attack is the best way of dealing with such a person, but I decided that it would be better to let him think he had tricked us. Here is a man with an English coat and English trousers, both showing signs of having been worn for at least a year, but according to his pile of papers, and according also to his own account, he is an American from Kansas, who has only recently arrived in London. There have been no advertisements about Garadebs. You know that I miss nothing of that sort. The small advertisements have often been useful to me in my cases, and I could not possibly have failed to notice one like that. I never knew a Dr. Lysander Starr of Topeka. Almost everything our visitor said was a he. I think he really is an American, but he has been in London for years, and his voice has gradually become less and less American. What is his aim, then? What is the purpose of this strange search for Gary Debs? The problem is worth our attention. Clearly this man is a criminal, but he is a strange and imaginative one. We must now find out if our other Gary Deb is a liar, too. Just ring him up, Watson, please. I did so, and heard a weak voice, rather like that of a goat, at the other end of the line. Yes, yes, I am Mr. Nathan Garadeb. Is Mr. Holmes there? I should very much like to have a word with Mr. Holmes. My friend took the telephone from me, and I heard his half of the conversation that followed. Yes, he has been here. I believe you don't know H.M. How long? Only two days. Yes, yes, of course. To receive five million dollars would be very nice. Will you be at home this evening? I suppose Mr. John Garadeb will not be there. Very good. We will come then. I would rather see you in his absence. Dr. Watson will come with me. Yes, in your letter, you mentioned you did not go out often. Well, we shall be with you at about six o'clock. You need not mention it to the American lawyer. Very good. Goodbye. On that lovely spring evening, even Little Ryder Street, off the Edgeware Road, in the Rathardellaria near to Burn where men and women were once cruelly hanged in public, looked golden and beautiful in the setting sun. The particular house to which we were directed was a large, old-fashioned, 18th-century brick building. On the ground floor there were two tall, wide windows. These belonged to the very large living room of the person we had come to see, who had only the ground floor of the house. As we went up to the door, Holmes pointed to the name Garadab, on a small plate. That nameplate has been there for years, Watson, he remarked. 
Its surface is quite worn, and it has lost its original color, so at least Garadeb is his real name. The house had a common hall and staircase, and there were a number of names painted in the hall. Some of these names were those of offices, others were those of private persons. No families lived in the house. The people who did live there were unmarried gentlemen of independent habits. Mr. Nathan Garadeb opened the door for us himself, explaining that the housekeeper left at four o'clock. He was a very tall, thin man with a bent back. He seemed to be about sixty years old. He had no hair on his head, and the skin of his face looked dull and dead. It was easy to see that he never took any exercise. He wore large, round glasses and had a small beard, but though he looked rather strange, he seemed pleasant. The room was as strange as Mr. Nathan Garadeb himself. It looked like a kind of shop. It was both broad and deep, and there were cupboards and glass cases everywhere, crowded with old bones and pieces of stone. On either side of the door there stood a case of flying insects pinned onto cards. All kinds of things were scattered on a large table in the center of the room. Among them I noticed several powerful magnifying glasses. As I looked round, I was surprised at the number of different subjects Mr. Garadeb was interested in. Here was a case of ancient coins. There was a collection of tools from the Stone Age. On a shelf behind the table, I saw a row of model heads of monkeys or ancient men, with names such as Neanderthal, Heidelberg, and Cro-Magnon written on cards below them. As he stood in front of us now, he held a piece of soft leather in his right hand with which he was polishing a coin. From Syracuse, and of the best period, he explained, holding it up. The quality became much worse later. In my opinion, there are no finer coins than these Syracusan ones, though some people prefer those from Alexandria. You will find a chair there, Mr. Holmes. One moment, please. I will just put those bones somewhere else. And you, sir? Ah, yes. Dr. Watson, would you mind putting that Japanese flower pot out of your way? You see round me all the little interests of my life. My doctor is always telling me I ought to take more exercise, but why should I go out? There are so many things to keep me here. Just to make a proper fist of all the things in one of these cupboards would take at least three months. Holmes looked round him with interest. But do you never go out? He asked. Hardly ever. Now and then I take a carriage and go and buy some new things for my collection, but I very rarely leave this room for any other reason. I am not very strong, and my scientific studies keep me very busy, but you can imagine, Mr. Holmes, what a shock, what a pleasant shock. It was for me, when I heard of this piece of good luck. Only one more Garadeb is needed to make the affair complete, and surely we can find one. I had a brother, but he is dead, and women relatives do not count. But there must be other Garadebs in the world. I had heard that you handled strange cases, and that was why I wrote to you. Of course, this American gentleman is quite right, and I should have taken his advice first but I acted with the best intentions. I think you acted very wisely, said Holmes, but are you really anxious to become the owner of a large piece of land along the Arkansas River in America?